Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call the special closed council meeting to order. And with that, I will recess it until after we have the open council and general purposes committee and the closed uh, general purposes uh, committee as well. Um, I'm proposing that the order, we have a very long agenda, so we're really gotta move through it. But I'm gonna suggest that we would start with the open council meetings and deal with these, um, the consent re resolutions of the two companies and then get into the GP agenda. So unless any councillors have an issue with that, uh, I will call to order the special council, open council meeting for May 16th, 2022. And the first item is the consent resolutions of the shareholder of the Olympic, Corpor uh, Olympic Oval Corporation, uh, which is the city of Richmond. Um, does staff have anything to tell us about? Uh, Councillor Day, you have a question. Yeah, I do. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Brody. Um, I'm actually concerned about this. Um, every one of our boards of every community center and organization, the decisions of who is going to serve on those boards is made by Richmond City Council. And for some reason in this uh, situation, the Oval um, shareholder, and we're the only shareholder, uh, it just seems that we should not be automatically approving these names. I think that there sh we should have been involved in the vetting process and seen all of the potential candidates. And so uh, I'm not really comfortable with moving this forward. I I think right. that we need to take a closer look at it. Councilor McNulty. Yeah, I have a, just a quick question as a matter of uh, uh, procedures here. On, on the, I think, um, given the situation we're in, Your Worship, on given, and, and it may be an in-camera item, how do we uh, ensure our own, our potentially new CAO is um, on the board of the Olympic Oval and at the Olympic Oval? Um, the... Our existing CAO is, is there. No, is the is the uh, CAO of the Oval Corporation. Right. The existing CAO is not on the board, and you know the oh, arrangements we, that have been made, and that now he will be on the board. So the CAO of the city is not there. Is the CAO of the of the Oval? Today, but as of July 15th. Well, I assume that it'll be the same way. The new CAO will also be the CAO. CAO. So one at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. All CAO. right, I just wanted clarity on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Thank you. Okay. All right, do you want to move the resolutions? Okay. Or someone move them? So Moved. Oh. And is it seconded? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? It's carried with Councillor Day opposed. Okay. Uh, and the consent resolutions of uh, Lulu Island Energy Company Limited. Any comments, questions? I do. Councillor McNulty? Yeah, just uh, if you recall, I, I believe it was a year ago I asked about a council liaison to it, and it was agreed that. Uh, that uh, that was a possibility, and I'd like to know what was done on it. To, to all of the thing. I'm not questioning the bodies that are there, but the whole idea with regard to the Energy Corporation. Um, it, can someone comment on that? I, I'm surprised to hear that because every single person on that board is a staff member. Yes, I know, but we, we did talk about it, if you recall, a year ago or thereabouts. And I had asked the question and I brought it up at that time. Okay, I don't recall it, but in any case, oh, does okay. anybody have anything to tell us about? Any staff member? Can you uh, help us out on that one? Yes, Your Worship, John Irving here. Just hold it a sec, just a minute. Where are you? Okay. Okay, go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, at last year's AGM, there was... Just a minute, we've got to get you some volume here. I've turned your mic on. Okay, try it again. Yes, I think as discussed at last year's meeting, we, we are actively looking at migrating the board population away from a staff uh, population. Just a minute, hold on a sec. 
Why can't we hear him? Okay, go up oh, there and sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Now try. Go Go forward. Testing. All good. Not really. Well, we can hear you any better. Then. <laughs> well, why don't we have this microphone's not on? Nothing. Try t test it right test it. now. One, two. No. I don't see any lights on your microphone yeah. either. What if you sat in this chair here with these microphones? Yeah, I'd give it a try over there. Okay. See if that works. Not your fault. <laughs> We've been needing a new system for a long time. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, at, at last year's AGM, uh, we did provide the response that we were looking at migrating the board uh, away from a staff populated board, although for this period we have been focused on moving forward with the city center district energy negotiations. I believe council at that time made a resolution to uh, empower the mayor's office to appoint a uh, council liaison should Oh. So much. Okay, I must say I don't remember that, but uh, Madam Clerk, if you can get us a copy of whatever resolution was passed, then Good. we'll deal with that. Okay, um, that, that's all I wanted. Thank you. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, we've got Councillor Day. Well, that was the exact point I wanted to make as well. In fact, I meant to make it regarding the Oval as well. I think that there should be a there um, is. member of Council on this. There board. is. Yeah, just as a liaison, but There not is to the Oval. Yes, but there isn't a person, a, a counselor on the actual board, but a liaison for the um, um, Lulu Island Energy Corp would, I think, be a great idea. Uh, counselor Lou. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you to the uh, to staff. Uh, on CNCL 91, it talks about um, pipe construction defect that resulted, and, and I know there's more um, that it talks about in the financial statements about there being... Um, uh, some legal proceedings and stuff. So I'm wondering if, or, or do we have a report in close that covers this or do we need a report in close? And I'm just wondering, um, is this pipe defect specific to the builder or the building or is it have to do more with seismic issues or the design itself of, of what's going on? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Lou, uh, the, the defect was just in, a, in a one expansion section of the distribution pipes in Alexander on McKim Way. So it's quite isolated. And as it turned out, yes, uh, this is, you know, to not get too technical, but it's high density polyethylene pipe. It's welded in sections and some of the welds weren't correctly done. So we've identified that the, the issue of the impact of that failure has been fully addressed and we'll probably be reconstructing that section through this summer to remove any further risk of any uh, future break. And we're expecting to have, uh, if not full recovery, through legal means and insurance means uh, certainly substantial recovery of all our costs. Okay, and then if there's any um, changes to how people should be building this stuff, that's been obviously passed on to the new um, builders who are building the add-ons <coughs> for the DEUs? Through your worship, correct. I mean, we could provide some more detailed response and closed, but uh, yes, it's an isolated situation. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll take a motion then. Moved and is it seconded? Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Is someone move adjournment? Okay, thank you. We are now adjourned. And I'll call to order the Open General Purposes Committee meeting um, to the agenda uh, for this. I want to add a simple matter as number four, which would be the federal election electoral boundaries, and uh, just to suggest a referral on that. So I have a motion with uh, that. That's a motion on the agenda. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Um, now, I'm just going to remind you, we've got a, a long agenda and we've also got the public hearing tonight, so we've got to uh, be uh, uh, brief in our remarks and uh, move it along. So may I have a motion on the minutes? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Then we have two delegations, both from TransLink, 
Uh, first of all, we'll turn over to Kevin Quinn and Sarah Ross. Uh, their outline, their qualifications are outlined in the agenda. And then we'll hear from Scott McIntosh to talk about the Caps and Canada Line Station. So first of all, we'll go to Kevin Quinn and Sarah Ross. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, I'll, I'll just note that in the background, my son's drum lesson just started at four. So you'll, you may have the same joy that I have every Monday uh, to hear my son's drums shake down our home. Okay, okay so um, if we could play the, uh, put up the uh, PowerPoint, please. Wonderful. Um, is that up there? Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, great. So I'll, um, I, I want to respect your time. Uh, I do want to just start off by noting that, uh, which is just a quick land acknowledgement, just noting that um, we do really respect the uh, indigenous nations on whose territories we're so fortunate to live, work and operate. And we really recognize that um, TransLink has a role to play in supporting reconciliation with indigenous peoples that we take very seriously. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the 10 year priorities. Um, so uh, we're here just to touch on that today. And, and this really focuses on the decade after the 2022 investment plan estimated to begin around 2025. And uh, the prioritized investments that are outlined in the 10 year priorities can then be incorporated into future uh, investment plans. Uh, next slide, please. So we're in the process of undertaking uh, both plans at the same time. And, and while we are doing those at the same time, they do reflect proposed investments over different timeframes. So we have the 2022 investment plan that focuses on the years 22 to 24, really focused on that three year period with an outlook to 2031. And so that's really intended to stabilize our finances uh, over the near term. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, and then what we're doing with the 10 year priorities is really taking uh, that 30 year vision that was set out in Transport 2050 that laid out that 30 year vision for uh, for our region that was adopted in 2022. And so now we're building a plan called Transport 2050 10 year priorities that sets out really what we as a region think we should get started on right away, how to start to chip away at that 30 year vision. Next slide, please. So the 10 year priorities uh, builds on the momentum of transport 2050 to make transportation better and more accessible for everyone uh, really contributes to the five transport 2050 goals to make moving in the region more convenient, reliable, affordable, safe uh, and comfortable and carbon free. So really focused on those five key areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the 10 year priorities outlines a, a pretty ambitious level of investment that TransLink will look to focus on delivering over the first decade of the 30 year plan. And that blueprint really uh, includes investing in convenient, reliable, safe and comfortable transit, things like supporting local transit and bus priorities to improve travel times, increasing sea bus and handy dart service, building out the reliable and fast network uh, and supporting things like people first streets and active transportation. Next slide, please. The uh, really one of the key cornerstones of the 10 year priorities is proposing a bus first approach with very historic investments to double local bus service. Uh, we are also proposing to increase service on C bus, on SkyTrain, and Handy Dart to improve convenience and reduce overcrowding. And finally, proposing significant improvements to passenger safety and comfort at uh, transit stops, stations, and exchanges. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a pretty big map uh, that shows potential new bus service areas. I'm not going to dive into all of these uh, that uh, just, but these are new areas uh, across the region, includes a new bus service to regional parks, uh, as well as several growing neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Uh, the 10-year priorities also proposes to include 170 kilometers of new rapid transit, including up to nine bus rapid transit corridors, which is a a technology we haven't seen in this region actually since the busway in Richmond became the Canada line. Uh, bus rapid transit or BRT is really a form of rapid transit using buses to, to deliver fast, frequent, reliable transit service, um, generally using dedicated lanes, transit signal priority, uh, premium stations and vehicles and offboard fare payment. I wanna be clear that this really differs from rapid bus, mainly with the use of dedicated lanes to keep buses out of congestion so that BRT buses are more reliable. Other investments include the Burnaby Mountain Gondola, uh, the Millennium Line UBC extension. And I just want to note that these corridors do support Metro 2050's growth management framework uh, in providing service to areas where the region is expected to grow. Next slide, please. 
uh, just to talk specifically about Richmond for a second, this map really um, shows the reliable and fast transit network uh, showing highlights for Richmond. And this includes a bus rapid transit line between Richmond Center and Metro Town via uh, Knight, Victoria and 49th Avenue. Uh, the plan also includes several new express services uh, and new service areas, including uh, Blundell Crosstown and Terra Nova. Uh, it also includes the R7 Richmond to Expo line. And uh, I want to note on this project, we're absolutely committed to delivering R7 as a quality rapid bus service. Uh, to do that, bus priority is really required to achieve that rapid bus service promise, which is 20% journey time savings and improve reliability. Uh, bus lanes are our most effective bus priority measures. And uh, I just want to note that we appreciate that that entails trade-offs with general traffic. Uh, we note that those trade-offs combined with rapid bus service uh, and amenities are aligned with Richmond OCP goals to increase transit mode share. And we look forward to continuing to work with your staff on this really key project. In total, we're planning around a 130% increase in total local bus service in the Southwest region. Next slide, please. The reliable and fast network also includes new express and interregional services, including the Highway 91 corridor over the Queensboro Bridge. We're also working with the province and neighboring regions to advance some interregional services to the Fraser Valley and the Sea to Sky corridor. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, last couple of things, uh, we're proposing historic investments in transforming people for our streets, as I noted earlier, making active travel safer and more convenient, which includes completing up to 75% of the 2050 major bikeway network and up to 66% of the 2050s walkway network. We want to look to install, <clears throat> excuse me, new bike lockers, bike parkades and counters and upgrade the BC Parkway. Uh, last slide, please. So the 10-year priorities will go to the Mayor's Council and TransLink Board for approval this summer. Uh, we will have a subsequent investment plan that will be needed uh, to fund the 10-year priorities with improvements to that starting in 2025. And with that, uh, that was a real quick overview. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And, and Sarah Ross, uh, VP of Planning and Policy, uh, is here with me today. And I are, we are happy to take your questions. Thank you. May I suggest that we carry on with the... Um the translating person on the capstan station, so then we can just cover any questions that we've got, if that's okay. Scott McIntosh. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, hey, great. So I'm Scott McIntosh, a senior project manager with TransLink. So thank you for this exciting opportunity to discuss the current progress on the Capstan SkyTrain station. So located between Bridgeport and Aberdeen, the Capstan station is the first infill station to be constructed on the Canada Line. This project is a partnership between the City of Richmond and TransLink to support adjacent transit-oriented development sites. Some of the interesting features of the station include dual escalators, elevators, and a commercial retail unit. Construction of the station began in 2021. Although most of you are familiar with the station, uh, here are some renderings showing different perspectives of it. So in the top left corner of the slide, you can see the main entrance to the concourse from the south with the new Concord Pacific development directly to the east. Um, as we swing around to the west, you can see perspectives across number three road, which will be fully reinstated once construction is complete. And in the northeast, there is a park site leading to the station. When driving by the site, you might not see a lot of work that has been done. This is because the majority of the work to date has been underground. So construction activities are progressing for the station's structural foundation including completing the piling, pile caps, and grade beams, which the station will sit on. Backfill is underway, which restores the ground to the normal level before the concrete floor of the building is installed. Our contractor took the picture on the left side of the screen from a lift so we can see an aerial view of the construction worksite. Installation of the building services, including water, sewers, power, and telecoms are underway. This has resulted in some lane closures and disruptions to traffic, but our team does work hard to reinstate these lane closures as quickly as possible. In order to build the station, there is a lot of work that needs to be completed near the train tracks. 
When working near trains, SkyTrain operations need to be adjusted for the safety of workers, passengers, and the public. This creates the need for single tracking, which is when trains operate only on one set of tracks, bus bridging, which is when we add additional bus service between, Richmond, between Bridgeport and Richmond Brighouse stations, and working at nights when ridership on the train is lower. We do apologize for any convenience this may have to passengers or re residents, but please understand it is a necessary part of bringing this project to life. A communication plan was implemented to support customers and neighbors through construction. This included extensive communication to transit customers through media notifications, website updates, and physical signage. When noisy work, night work, or weekend works are required, we will send out letters to nearby residents and businesses to make sure everyone is informed. We also work with Richmond organizations that support people with disabilities to minimize our impacts. As a result of this hard work, we have received minimal, minimal customer or residential complaints so far. One of the exciting activities that we'll be starting soon is the installation of the station structure, which consists of five H-frames. The H-frames, which can be seen in this rendering, include two vertical columns at either side of the guideway with one piece that joins them together like a bow tie. Each column weighs over 16,000 pounds and will be lifted into place by cranes. Once installed, the station will start to visually take place, take shape, as again, most of the work we've done to, uh, to date has been underground and ends up getting covered with dirt. Temporary art has been installed on the fencing around the site. The artwork was commissioned from Richmond-based artists. This great work has really helped to liven up the area, including the park site to the northeast and the fencing along number three road to the northwest. The TransLink social team also filmed a video featuring the local artists and their art pieces. The video was shared on social media and City of Richmond's communication staff helped to amplify the positive news via their channels to promote these Richmond artists. The video has received a strong, a strong reception so far, and we would like to thank these wonderful artists for their contributions. As part of Doors Open Richmond, the works will also be featured on the Richmond Public Art Walking Tour on Sunday, June 5th at 11 a.m. We're also working with an, on an exciting permanent art piece for the station, and once the artwork has been finalized, we will share more details. From the project schedule, Design was completed in 2021 and construction began later that year and the station remains on track to open in 2023. And thank you, happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll ask for any uh, comments or questions. And uh, I just emphasize, we got a long agenda, so we need to uh, really keep it brief. Uh, Councillor Liu. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through the through you to the delegation. Mr. Quinn, congratulations on your appointment as CEO. We really appreciate the work you do and, and the partnerships we have to move people forward. Um, the devil is in the details. And so I'm thinking about uh, Steveston Highway. It's our major arterial road. It's not safe, it's not carbon free, and it's not convenient to have your buses stop there for long periods of time. I don't know what you call it, maybe repositioning something else. Um, is there some, what, what can we do to get those buses not to just sit parked on our biggest through fare road in Richmond. Yeah. So I know that's an issue raised before. Sarah, maybe if you could talk a bit about the work that I know that we've done with uh, some staff to try to identify some other locations there. Um, maybe you could speak to that more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we appreciate it's always uh, difficult. We've got bus operating needs and places where we need to have the, our, our buses, what's called layover and where our operators can access bathroom facilities. Um, sometimes that's difficult to find a spot that's also um, unobtrusive. But I know that uh, particularly CMBC, Coast Mountain Bus Company that operates the buses is, is work and, and our team is working closely with uh, the your engineering group to assess what the options are um, and to to develop whether there are alternatives or evaluate or evaluate them. So we are aware of the of the concern that, that Richmond has in that spot. Okay, thank you. Because that's really the worst possible location you could have chosen. And then my follow up question is um, for bus rapid transit, will will there be enough room on 
the buses during peak times for bikes and strollers and things. So for people trying to have different alternatives for that last mile of or last little bit of their their journey, are they still going to be able to bring bikes on those? Um, are you um, you're referring to specifically to like the future BRT vehicles? Yeah, the BRT. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but bus rapid transit vehicles are generally more spacious and more shaped uh, interior like a train would be. And so uh, I think our expectation would be that there is plenty of room for those types of things. We may need to look at what the capacity constraints might be during uh, peak hours around bikes and things like that. So, I, you know, we haven't developed a policy around that yet. I guess what I'd say is that they are more spacious than your normal buses. And so I think that, you know, as we have these conversations, that's something certainly we've got to keep in mind. That's, a, that's very important. Thank you. Okay, Councilman McNulty. Yeah, thank you uh, very, very much uh, for the report. It's a good report on paper. Uh, I want to go back to the Stevenson Exchange. Uh, I've been around a little bit on, on this council, and there are people in Stevenson willing to cooperate to provide a solution for you. I keep hearing about options, and I'm going to be very bullish about it. Uh, it's not safe down there, okay? And we got to get something. The Harbor Authority will work with you, and we will work with you. The problem is you don't want to buy any property, and that's the way it's been for 30 years. And uh, I think it's time uh, uh, you and, and others got together on it and uh, put some money in it, because it is, for us, a very big political problem, and uh, it's also a public problem. So I throw that on you, uh, on it. We can find your bathrooms. That's no problem. We find everything you need. We've got to have a will, and um, I'm going from there. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. I'm going to put a, a, a shout out for the handy dart um, and the ridership. We talk about minimizing trip denials and refusal. Uh, with the aging, um, I um, liaised to RCD uh, for many, many years and, and work with them now and other counselors do. With the aging populations of motorized uh, wheelchairs, which are very popular now and be more on the road than you would think, walkers, and uh, canes. Uh, I guess my question is what do we have a specific report having worked with um, uh, disabled associations um, to get input from from them to s say what they need not what they think I or I think they need or somebody around this table thinks they need somebody that actually lives and has to wait three and four hours uh, to get a a trip. I mean, even the taxi cabs won't pick them up. And All right, let's them. let's get an answer. We get an answer. Handy dart. Do you have a plan, a specific plan that we could refer to? Sure. So, so we do have a Handy Dart Users Advisory Committee that um, provides us input that are users of the Handy Dart system. Um, uh, it's uh, has lots of great input and feedback on that. Sarah, I know you're plugged into that. Maybe you could say just a couple words about that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we meet uh, regularly with the, that Handy Dart users group. We also um, several years ago did do quite a lot of work on reviewing uh, 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 what some of the issues are facing Handy Dart, and many of the recommendations uh, from that uh, have been implemented. But there is more work to be done. Uh, on improving Handy Dart, and we continue to work with with users, uh, both on ensuring the Handy Dart service is available and high quality, and as well as working to as our ongoing commitment to increase the accessibility of the conventional system to enable as many people as possible to take to take the conventional system. Okay, I think we need to deal with the current uh, ridership demand. Uh, before we go to the future, but anyhow, I'd like to. I, where would we get minutes or, or understand where the uh, advisory committee is discussing on some of the suggestions that they're coming up with? Um, we can certainly uh, provide a follow up with um, uh, information um, on the, those uh, those initiatives and the work of the advisory yeah. committee. I look forward to seeing those if we could get them maybe sure. through staff, your worship. Yes, get them um, to staff, and staff can circulate them to us. Thank you right, very much. We'll do that. Right. Uh, Councillor Steves, Harold. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, just a quick comment. I, I'm, I've raised this issue a lot of times in Metro Vancouver, and I'm certainly not happy with your uh, translink uh, planning for the Steveson area. And in my opinion, it should be in conjunction. The, the station should be somewhere close to the community center, which, where, where, which is where the community draw is, and the and the uh, right close to the town center. But the question I've got is, what kind of fuel are your bus is going to run on? 
uh, our future plan is that the majority of the bus fleet is is fully electrified, so that we would uh, over time shift uh, from uh, uh, diesel to uh, battery electric buses. Okay, so there, there, you can get buses that can run that uh, express buses that can run that uh, that that far was on without recharging along the way. So we may have to have both uh, um, sort of chargers at our facilities as well as on street. Uh, at a variety of locations throughout the Metro Vancouver area, we may have to install chargers. Um, but in that way, yes, uh, with the advancements that have been made in, in battery technology, uh, that's that's the plan. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I just want to advise you against biofuel. Everybody thinks we're going to produce biofuel, and it's just yeah. not possible. I can tell you, Councillor Steves, that uh, getting that low carbon fleet is uh, really a top priority for TransLink. And I, th I think the idea is by 2030, it will be fully electrified, if not before. Is that right, Kevin? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, the majority of the fleet, I think, is uh, turned over by, I think it's 2033, is majority electrified. But um, yes, in, that's exactly the plan. In any case, yep. it's a Great. top priority. Yes, that's Great. absolutely top priority. Yep. Thanks very much. Okay, Councillor Wolf. Uh, thank you, uh, through your worship, to our delegates from Transing. A few questions that I need to share the load on. Uh, the first one <clears throat> uh, is related to uh, pre-COVID levels of, of bus service. Uh, is it that we're not expecting to get back to the pre-COVID level until 2025? Is that correct? Um, I think our, so our modeling right now shows us getting to around 80% by the end of this year. And I think projections, Sarah, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think maybe that's about right. Maybe end of 2024 to be back to around hundred um, percent. Kevin is speaking about ridership oh, I'm sorry. and I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not sorry. sure, perhaps I think maybe your question was actually about the service levels. Yes, the service levels. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are, we did make some adjustments on the, overall bus service to to respond to uh, the lower ridership demand by reducing bus service by about four uh, percent and that that's when I look at on average across the region um, uh, we also did some other reallocations and we, we've only focused uh, we only reduced services on places where we had very high frequency routes where we could reduce some of the service without causing, uh, overcrowding. So I'm talking about places where the service used to run every four to five minutes. We've been able to reduce it to every, say, six to seven to eight minutes uh, because there's, there is less um, ridership. But we've looked for ways to do that, uh, you know, because of the imperative of being, uh, of the financial, um, the need to be, make the really the best use we can with our limited right. um, financial resources. Your next uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I got a few of them. Um, the next question relates to de um, maybe dealing with that lack of, of service or catch up, I guess. Um, I've heard that Quebec has ordered over 2000 new buses. Whereabouts are, is TransLink at for ordering new buses? And related to Harold's question, um, what what like rough ratio do you have for electric to, to non-electric up for that order? So right now we have, um, I think it's five uh, electric buses in the fleet. We've ordered another 15 for this year. Uh, and the plan moving forward, I think the number is 84 per year moving forward. And part of that has to do with a fleet turnover ratio with how many buses we've ordered. So there's a, a certain percentage of the fleet every year that gets turned over. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, great detail. We, we um, actually have the largest electric fleet in North America, though, because of our electric yeah. trolleys already. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. oh, I did. put that plug in. Well, Vancouver, good is plug to make. Vancouver is fully electrified. Great, uh, thank you. Um, next, next one uh, relates to um, the Highway 91 corridor, which was mentioned in the presentation. There, um, where or what what level of communication does TransLink have with the Port of Vancouver? Because our, our council here received uh, probably two years ago kind of an update on what the the port was planning to fund for highway maintenance and expansion. And I'm, I'm the only counselor who takes Highway 91 to East Richmond every day and back um, for home. Um, and so where, where are we at for creating a bus lane on that route, which gets plugged in both directions, both rush hours? Yeah. Sarah, can you take that one? 
Yeah, so we, um, we're working, we have a, a high level of communication, both with the port generally, but also with particularly on this corridor, primarily with the province, uh, the province of BC, uh, and um, working with them on what uh, the, the plans are to um, uh, have uh, the highest quality possible bus service um, on that facility when the new, um, when the new tunnel is open. Great, yeah, just a comment on that before my next question. Um, uh, yeah, I, I see great service with the express buses and the double deckers are packed. Uh, people getting dropped off for seven o'clock to catch another bus and they're jaywalking to get to the next stop because it, it's got a mad rush to get through all the bus uh, stops. Um, but I also would adamantly um, suggest that you, you do work with the port because it, it, it is through their proposal to us on what projects they were gonna expand so it seems like the provincial government's downloading to them to make some decisions so to make sure you're in touch with them. Um, my next question, if I may. Uh, Councillor, to... Councillor, this has got to be your last question, okay? We just don't have more time. Uh, um, where is Transincat for working on a grid of bus routes to make it so that no Richmond resident has to walk more than five minutes to get to a bus stop? So at a high level, I can say that, you know, Transport 2050 lays out some pretty high goals uh, around those concepts. Um, and part of 10-year uh, priorities that we just rolled out is all about doubling local bus service. Um, and, and part of that is the zeroing in on Richmond to be sure that Richmond residents have uh, higher frequency and reliability. Um, Sarah, any more kind of detail you want to add to that? And we would look over time to be growing bus service overall as consistent with the, um, the deep dive area plan that we developed with Richmond um, a couple of years ago. Okay, thanks for the tag team and enjoy the drumming beats in the back there, Kevin. Thank you. So, so Councillor Wolf or anybody else who has more questions for TransLink, by all means, probably through Lloyd B, compile the questions, we'll send them along, we'll get answers to them. I can tell you these guys, We'll answer any questions you've got and then some. So uh, I just want to thank the three of you, uh, Kevin, Sarah, Scott. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, very informative. These are important days for TransLink as we get to some very important uh, decisions really by midsummer this year. So thanks very much Absolutely. for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. That brings us to the next item on the agenda, the election procedure amendment bylaw for the mail-in ballot. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you have any comments on that report? We have no comments, but can certainly answer questions. All right. So the recommendation has been moved and seconded. Any, kind of, any comments or questions? All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. I just want to remark that it's it's incredible that uh, some cities aren't doing it, but whatever. Um, and the, the last thing is is an item, uh, uh, Councillor Day brought this up, um, but we've all been reading about the federal electoral boundaries. And the proposal is, you know, Delta, they've really done a number on Delta, and they proposed that as part of Richmond's, uh, Steve's and Richmond East, that they'll, give a, a small sliver of, of Delta for some reason to that riding, which to me makes no sense. But in any case, my suggestion is we would may have a referral to staff to take a look at the proposals and make comment. Uh, Councilor Day, that's what you had in mind. Just a minute. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mayor Brody. Yeah, when I saw this, it made no logical sense, and I suspect that some pencil sh sh uh, shoveler uh, came up with this idea. So I, I do believe we're going to be opposing this once we look into it a little bit further, because it's illogical to have an MP in right. Richmond representing just this little sliver. I mean, almost nobody lives in that area, so it doesn't make sense. So that's your motion. Uh, yeah, well, You're moving I, it? Yes, move it. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Councilor McNulty? Yeah, thank you very much, Your Worship. I think, uh, I think it's important, as one time we did have, uh, it took us a long time to get uh, our own yeah. uh, ML. Um, the Duna and Geography and Population, Your Worship, what is the next step or, or in terms of population to get a fourth uh, uh, or a, a third uh, MP and uh, uh, um, a fourth uh, uh, and another MLA? 
Are we Certainly. not, um, our census, I was very disappointed to see the census again from uh, um, the census from uh, four or five years ago, because we were robbed, in my opinion, then, and I believe at 208,000 people, I think we've got way more in, in there, and maybe they didn't work on weekends to find out who was really living in those homes, but well, I believe we're well over 208. We will and get the answer on federally with this referral. As far as the, the MLAs, that's a provincial matter. Right, but I think we should look at it all. But. All right, uh, Councillor Hobbs. Uh, thank you, and through the Chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll be supporting this. I think uh, the proposal is actually a step backwards for Richmond. So um, the one question I have of staff is, I, I think I read somewhere, or for anybody, uh, that the deadline for submissions was October. So we have quite a bit of time, right? Uh, I had heard September, but in any case, in okay. early fall. No rush right um, now. And so that would be part of it uh, in sure. terms of talking to staff to make sure that we have it. I can tell you that Delta is, is, is uh, opposed to this move. Mm. I mean, it, it's really bad for Delta, I think. Um, and their matter goes to their council tonight. And so I've been speaking with Mayor Harvey about this and uh, I also indicated to him, I, I felt that we would not be uh, thrilled about it either. Uh, Councilor Wolf. Uh, it just your worship, if you could clarify, what, what was Delta's um, uh, wording? Was it similar to what uh, the motion is on the table right now? I don't have it in front of me, uh, but it was in opposition. And it's, it's very simple. They, they finally got one MP for the whole city notwithstanding that it, their, their city is kind of in different parts, Ladner, Tawasson, North Delta. Um, and now they're going to have parts of three different ridings in their city, and, and they really are opposed to that whole notion. Uh, uh, so if, I'm, if I may, can I, can I ask for an amendment then that we make that statement and secondly, ask staff to write a comment to be submitted? But I, I, if Delta is making the opposition comment that their residents will hear, I think we should be doing it at the same time. Um, given, given what Councillor Hobbs says, and the deadline for comment is not for a number of months. Uh, from my point of view, I don't think, let, let's find out all the facts, find out, nail down our position, and it'll be probably uh, what you say would probably be a big part of it. Well, but if if I, if I may, just on that, if, if we're if if I didn't hear anyone uh, on council speak for to keep it uh, with inclus inclusive of Delta, so if, if we're we're unanimously supportive of not doing that, I think the sooner we come out to make that statement, the more other voices will add to it. So I think it's, there's only better hope if we if we make the opposition statement now. If we, by the referral, we'll have all the facts in front of us and we'll make our statement, we'll make it once and for all. So with that, I'm gonna call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? That is carried. Someone wanna move adjournment? Okay, we are now adjourned and